Good evening. Good evening. Here we are for the panel discussion after the viewing of Chisholm 72 unbought and unbossed. And I have some local Utah women that have been unbought and unbossed that I want to introduce you to as we begin the discussion and debrief um, of this wonderful movie. First, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Tamara Stevenson. She is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah. In this role, she provides direct oversight of DEI and leadership towards strengthening and sustaining diversity, advancing equity and cultivating inclusion in the college's structures, policies and practices. She most recently served as an associate professor in the college's communication program. She joined Westminster in 2012 as a postdoctoral teaching fellow in speech communication. She joined the full-time faculty as an assistant professor the following year. Betty Sawyer is the president of the Ogden branch of the NAACP. She's co-founder and director of the, People, the Project Success Coalition, community engagement coordinator in access and diversity at Weber State University, and a charter member of Greater Salt Lake Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Miss Betty is a connector and a builder and has been an agent for change in the city of Ogden and Utah for over 40 years. Her work in advocacy stand today with the creation of the state's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Human Rights Commission while serving as director of the Office of Black Affairs. Ms. Betty's work with Project Success includes Harambe Tobacco and Health Network, the Utah Juneteenth Freedom and Heritage Festival and Holiday, and the Utah Black Roundtable. These initiatives demonstrate the value she sees in equity, diversity, and inclusion at all levels. Representative Sandra Hollins is the first Black American woman elected to the Utah State Legislature. She is a member of the Utah House of Representatives, where she has proudly served District 23 since 2015. She successfully passed legislation banning knee on the neck restraint by law enforcement, requiring cultural training for school resource officers, increasing job opportunities for the formerly incarcerated, and removing the provision that allows for slavery in the Utah State Constitution. Ms. Sandra is a licensed clinical social worker and the primary focus of her career has been on substance abuse treatment and advocacy services for Salt Lake City's homeless population. She received her bachelor's degree in business management from the University of Phoenix and her master's degree in social work from the University of Utah. She is in the process of starting her own private practice called Better Minds Counseling and Consulting LLC. My name is Michelle Loveday and I've been an educator for 19 years. I received my bachelor's in education and my master's in reading from Bowling Green State University and my master's in education leadership and policy from the Utah, the University of Utah. My second language is Spanish and I studied abroad in Acala, Spain. I taught in North Carolina for three years until I relocated to Utah in 2005. After being a teacher, a literacy coach, and principal for seven years, I became the Associate Director of Educational Equity for four years. But in March of 2020, I became a consultant for Jordan School District and the Educational Language Services Teaching and Learning. I run and operate my um, consulting company, Love Day Educational Consulting, and I'm the founder of Rise Virtual Academy, a, an academy for Black students K-12 here in Utah. Ladies, welcome to the panel. And if I can add to everyone out there, just so you know, we are all members proudly of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and we are proud to have viewed our special Chisholm, our Soror Chisholm, as we call her. So let's jump into the discussion and we will take some questions um, following if we have time. So ladies, the first scene takes place in the opening of a church. Um, and, you know, the tie between the Black church and politics was huge during the Civil Rights Movement and, and beyond. Does that need to continue as we move forward and where we are today? And we can start with Miss Betty. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I think the church still is a part of our foundation or cornerstone for information sharing. Uh, resource identification, and yes, speaking truth to power, 
And so the need is still there. I know we've seen changes over the years. It's not like it was in the earlier days, the decades of the civil rights movement, but I think we still have leaders today that are speaking that truth and that are providing an opportunity for us to learn and grow. Because for many of us, the church was our proving ground. That's where it all started. And I think it's just as relevant for us today. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Tamara, do you have something that you wanna say, Dr. Tamara? So I certainly echo uh, Ms. Betty's uh, comments about the role of the church, particularly during the civil rights movement. And I think that was such a pivotal time for the church politically, socially, culturally. And I think in many instances that still exists. Uh, I think this pandemic has uh, offered um, some challenges to, to certain uh, churches who, for example, have older populations and weren't quite able, haven't been able to make that transition into to serving older populations versus younger populations who gravitate toward uh, technology and, and social media in such easier ways. But because there's such a, a strong uh, community uh, center that the black church uh, still has, I think there's opportunity for the church to, to transform into the 21st century in some really powerful and creative ways now more than ever. So the black church has a special place in my heart and uh, I'd like to see it uh, continue. And in, and in some instances, go back to the old landmark, as they say, and let's revisit uh, those, those strong communal ties that kept us together culturally. So Representative Hollins, you feel free to answer the question before, but then tagging on with Dr. Stevenson here, do you feel that the reason why the Black church had kind of slowed down, for lack of a better phrase, on being involved is because of the the separation of church and state, or do you feel like it was just utilized in different ways? You know, I just think the church, um, I think the church is still going pretty strong, um, in, in my opinion. You know, I, I grew up in the church. The church was my training ground. You know, it's where I learned all a lot of my life's lesson is where I learned about social justice, because this was the safe space for us to have those conversations in our community. And I think it still holds true today. Um, I think uh, we see churches that are now evolving now and they are taking on and tackling more social justice issues. We have seen churches um, get now getting more politically involved. Um, but particularly the black church, I've, I've seen them stand up. I've seen them them take their they're taking their place. You have all of you have a lot of these young people who are in the church and they have all of this energy, and they want to do something. And I think the church is the perfect spot to channel that energy and, and to give them a voice in the community. You know, when I um, when last summer, this past summer when um, the civil unrest started to occur in, here in Utah. Um, and I went out on the front line and, and called for peaceful protests. Notice that I did it from in front of a church. And I did that on purpose. Um, I held that press conference at a church on purpose, knowing that this is the foundation uh, of social justice movement. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's still relevant. Uh, it's very much relevant today. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, many pastors now are seeing the, the ability to combine everything that we believe in and, and the structure, like you said, the foundation of our beliefs so that we can continue to move forward as things continue um, to evolve and happen. So in that speech that when uh, Mrs. Chisholm was in the church, she makes a point in her speech to say that although I am black and proud and a woman, I am not running for those two. I am doing what the people want. Uh, so in her saying that, should she have focused more on the Black community for her vote? Was she ahead of her time? And should she have taken time to campaign more in churches throughout her campaign? Do you think that that would have helped the support? Um, I'll start with uh, Miss Betty here again. Okay. Uh, I think in hindsight, you know, we could say that that would have been something that could have helped her along. But I think oftentimes in our own space, we make some assumptions 
that people know me, they support me, they'll follow me and all of that. And I think one of the things she was trying to make sure that she was doing was speaking to the issues. And she felt that she could be upfront and, and, and unapologetically speaking to what was important to the people that they would hear that message and respond appropriately. But we know that's not always the case. What we say and how it's interpreted are different, but she was very clear in her message that it was a message to the people. It was a message to her people. But at the same time, I think she was smart enough to know that she couldn't win alone but with the black community by itself. So right. she had to speak across all of those divides or across all of those uh, political areas to, to women, to men, to rural, to city, to you know all of those things to bring uh, that support together. And I think that was her goal to unify on the issue and not just on this color of our skin. Yes. Dr. Stevenson and Representative Hollins, do you want to speak to that? Well, I, I agree. I agree with everything Miss Miss Betty said. She was speaking to a larger audience. Um, I think a lot of times when um, we are elected to office in particularly black women, um, it is thought that we are only speaking to our community you know, and that we will only represent our communities, that we don't have the ability or the intelligence to be able to represent a cross section of people and a cross section of issues. You know, when we look out into to a lot of these issues, you know, environmental issues are our issues. So we could speak to that. You know, during that time, the Vietnam War was affecting uh, all of our communities. So that was something she was able to, to speak to. Um, during that time. And I think like was said, you know, um, a lot of times when you look back, you just assume that your community is going to be on board with you. Um, and so you, uh, politically, um, it would make sense strategically that I'm now going to reach out to these other communities and try to bring them in and make them understand and believe in my message also. But unfortunately, a lot of that didn't happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, but she still delivered her message, which was, a, like I said, a message of unifying and, um, and on the issues of that time. Yes. Such an ambitious uh, effort on, on Sir Chisholm's part. Uh, she really crystallized what we now call uh, intersectionality, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, who coined that phrase in explaining the, the repercussions and consequences and also just uh, bringing out a very obvious issue that our identities aren't linear, mm -hmm. right? That they do overlap and they do cross. And then depending on how they cross is how you either get access or, ex or you're excluded from uh, uh, services and, and, and support. Uh, she often said, or at least I heard in the documentary, she said, that, uh, and I paraphrase, that she seemed that there was more resistance to her gender than her race. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that because <laughs> I can't, you know, it's not as if you can cut any of us, or at least me, down the middle, and part of me is gender, part of me is race. It is so intertwined that they cannot be uh, dissected or deconstructed, uh, although some people do think that way. So uh, you know, I, I, I'm, it's a fascinating tension, and I'm so curious that I would ask her about that. Like, how do you, it, the feminist leanings that she had, um, and, and, and I think as much as she was disappointed that the, the, the Black support was waned over time, there, was, there seemed to even be a deeper disappointment that the women uh, weren't, weren't supportive of her, that they, uh, and then one of her, her staffers kind of said what well, she might not say, it, but I will. It's not, yes, she's a woman, but she's black. Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't support her. At least that's his premise. Yeah. So I'd, I'd really be curious to know how she reconciled that if she ever did. And, and you know, we, again, we see that happen today where they're particularly for women of color, for black women, um, and we can certainly unpack uh, what that looks like theoretically around um, feminism, womanism, black feminist thought, and how that informs how, how black women interact and how they consider their race and their gender and where their loyalties lie. Yes. 
Yes, and and in one instance, as I think about this and and looked at how she ran for office, and I you know had my little stint in 2019 running for office, having that intersectionality of being a black female running for office, there was a lot of pressure in a sense that made me feel like I was on an island all alone. So. So Miss Betty and Representative Hollins, especially, do you relate? Um, I saw a lot of ways that I related to um, Miss Chisholm and what she experienced while a candidate. You know, I showed my mom and dad a picture of me running for office next to all these white people and white men. And my mom was like, oh, you're among the good old boys. Okay, I'm gonna pray for you. So hearing the stories uh, that she encountered um, what can you two, Representative Hollins especially, and um, Miss Betty just most recently, um, relate to what she experienced? Representative Hollins? You know, I, I, I can relate to a lot of what she, what she experienced being, being Black and being a woman and in that space. You know, um, uh, when you walk into those spaces, the, for some of my colleagues and some of the people that I encounter the only thing they know about a black woman is what they've seen on tv and we know a lot of times those images are negative images and so when i walk into a room i find that i have to be particularly conscious of of myself and making sure that um knowing that i'm not that i am not only representing sandra hollins for some of them, I'm representing every black woman in the state of Utah, you know, and, and I've, I've said, and I know that representation is important and, and being in that space is, is important. And sometimes when you walk into that space, you have to decide what part of you are you going to give in that space, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. I have to be conscious of my tone because I don't want to come across as that angry black woman. And so I have to, I'm always conscious and I have to always be mindful of what I'm giving and I have to always be mindful of my, of my appearance. You know, this, this past week, a um, couple of weeks ago, I went and got, um, I went and got twist in my hair. And I tell people the reason I, I got twist in my hair for two reasons. Number one, we're, we're discussing black women's hair up at the Capitol, but also, um, um, being that representation for little girls, because realizing that there's a number of little girls that look up to me that their hair, their hair looks like this. And I want them to be able to see themselves in me, you know, and knowing that there is a place and a space for them in politics uh, here. You know, um, I'm the first. I didn't have anybody that's leading me. I'm fortunate that I've had people like Miss Betty who kind of you know, tore down that wall, you know, with her run for for this position. Um, and I think part of that with Miss um, Chisholm, when you look at her and look at what you what she did, no, she didn't win. But I could tell you, she tore down a lot of barriers. She tore down a lot of barriers um, and made it possible so that I am able to, to, to stand and, you know, and take my rightful place um, in politics in the state of Utah. Yes, thank you, thank you. Miss Betty, any yes. relation to what she experienced? Definitely, so so many. As I looked at that, I thought about the first time I decided to run for office. And, and for us, often, no one's coming knocking on your door and saying, would you be our representative? We want to support you. We're not being recruited as that star player, okay? We just go and do it, and that's what she did. Not asking permission, Mm -hmm. being unapologetic who she was standing on her principles and, and being an intelligent woman who yeah. knew she had something that the world needed. Mm -hmm. And so in order for the world to get that, she had to step out on faith and go after it herself. Like I said, every time I run for office, uh, I have folks look at me like, what are you doing here? Who told you you could do this? And I'm like, hey, I told myself. I looked down among the people even my representative at the time, I was working in the governor's office. So I'm up at the Capitol doing the legislative session almost every day. And I'm watching folks sleeping. I'm watching them not paying attention. 
coming and going, uh, not knowing the issue. And I'm like, if they're representing me, oh no, I could do better than this myself. So why not? But again, like I said, we're not recruited as a star player. So when we enter that space, we have to come in uh, with a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of conviction, because mm -hmm. we're on an uphill, uphill trajectory the whole time. And, and for her, uh, for, for Mrs. Chisholm, that's how she walked into the room. I'm here, <laughs> like it or not, I'm here. This is my truth. I'm speaking truth to power. And as she even said, you know, power concedes nothing without demand. Never has, never will. So we can, we can, you know, shrink and try to pretend and all of that. But at the end of the day, uh, our integrity is what we have. Our values is all we have. And so as, as black women, oftentimes people do want to put us in boxes. They do want to judge you by trivial stuff that has nothing to do with anything. My hair, my makeup, my clothes, and, and never getting into your mind and what you have to offer. So I, I saw so many parallels with, with her life and what we're still, unfortunately, up against today. And we shouldn't have to be up against those same hurdles. Yes. And Can I just and add? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that. You know, she, she, I think people don't realize how ahead of her time she was. She come out of a generation that was taught to be silent, where her parents probably taught her how to survive in America. And that meant holding your tongue, that means being quiet, and that means knowing your place as a woman and as a, as a, as a Black American during that time. And for her to speak out and, and, and talk and have a voice and have a mind and to show that she was intelligent, you know, because a lot of times we, we couldn't show that we were smart or that we were intelligent. So for her to bring all of that to the table and say, this is who I am, she was so ahead of, of her time and she was so bold and so brave um, 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 during that time period. Yes, and it was almost to the point where at the end of the film, you heard it a couple times, they said it in different ways, but the one phrase that stuck with me the most was, we questioned her sanity, that we said no, but she still got up. And it was, and, you know, it's kind of like what you said, Ms. Betty, it's like, well, you can say no, but I still see a need here. So I'm gonna stand up. So Dr. Stevenson, this is especially to you because you've had a class, um, you know, how to be a, a wonderful unbought BIT. <laughs> And it's been a, a, a very successful class that you've run through Westminster. So Octa Octavia Butler, she was on the uh, film and she said that black women are just not valued. And it almost seemed painful that Chisholm was the leading member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Here she is. And one of the founding members of the National Organization of Women now, right? So those two key organizations that she was a part of and you know we've mentioned it prior too that that intersectionality, you know they both failed her in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess a two part question for me is how did black men fail her? And then most importantly again, how did white women, I feel, how did they use her for their platform? So Dr. Stevenson, the second uh, part of the title of that class is called "Reframing the Realities of Women in Leadership." Okay. So clearly, uh, Mrs. Chisholm was a leader and her work uh, did pave the way for many uh, black men, black women, white women to, to pursue political office. And if we were to look at the roster today, even the number of her sorors who are in political office today is, clear, are, is clearly we're standing on her shoulders. So to your point about, and I loved how you phrased that, how, how black men failed her and how white women exploited her. And quite honestly, both did both. 
Black men also used her, right? It, she was a mouthpiece. She was a safe mouthpiece, if you will, right? Because there was a gender dynamic there too that Black men wouldn't necessarily in, have to engage with. Uh, um, white women used her in the sense of, and I, I quite honestly, I, I felt um, some sense of, of uh, comfort, I guess, if you will. I actually believe some of those white women were, were, uh, were engaged in her, her leadership, wanted her to win. But I think the nexus of both black men and white women were that they, they kept saying they wanted to go with someone who, was a, who would win. They literally just did not believe she could win. And she was saying to them, I can win if you support me. I can win, I can do this. Or if not, if not win, we'll have leverage mm -hmm. to demand change. She says in the film, and I, I, I wrote it down, find out what these candidates who need our votes to get across the top are going to do concretely, not rhetorically. She was trying to get that point across so strongly, representation and power. So if the, the multi-layer failure of it was that they didn't trust what she was saying. They wanted to go with the easy win. And quite honestly, they ended up losing because the Republican candidate won. And then Watergate happened. So he <laughs> <laughs> in two years in, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> that that's that's it. It's just the reluctance from from them on the female male issue and just not having that um and the hurt behind it. Um I think looking at that, it then trans transcends the power. You know, there's still a lot of issues. We still haven't really even passed the ERA in so many areas. We're still held. I was surprised as I listened to my mom talk growing up. And then I'm here now as a mother. And I'm like, oh my goodness, there's still so much that we haven't touched <laughs> at all. Um, but then seeing because of what she paid, that pathway, that visionary pathway, we are now celebrating women who are helping the election. You know, our own sores, right? Stacey Abrams and Keisha Bottoms and Marsha Fudge and our very own Sandra Hollins. So just the confidence of being unbought and unbossed was something that she knew would intimidate people, yet she pressed on. We know it intimidates people. We, we know when we're unbought and unbossed, it comes off, you know, as you said, Representative Hollins as the angry black woman, but we know we have to push forward. So in what ways do you see this evident in our modern day black female politicians? And do you feel that being unbought and unbossed now is received a little better than prior or are we still ch having challenges? I, I think we're still having some challenges. <laughs> uh, when I um, was watching um, um, I would now um, vice president, <laughs> it's also good to say that Harris, <laughs> um, and I would look at some of the stories and I would read some of the, some of the comments um, behind her and some people questioning, questioning whether she was an authentic black woman, a woman of color. Um, and it was, I, when I read the comments and, and was saw on social media who was responding to this, a lot of it was black men. Mm. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> wow. You know, um, so I think it, we still have a long way to, to go as, as black women. Um, as I said earlier, it, it's, it's um, sometimes it's hard to bring all of you to the table, but you have to determine what you're willing to compromise on. One of the mm. things I heard Chisholm say was, I, will, I, I, I have integrity. I'm gonna stand on my integrity. And that's one of the things that I have tried to do. You know, there are some things I won't compromise. I'm not gonna dumb myself down to make you feel better about yourself. I'm not gonna compromise my integrity. You know, I'm not gonna compromise who I am. And I think, unfortunately, there are some women who feel that they have to do that, unfortunately, in politics to get things done. Um, but you have to determine what your foundation is. You got to determine what you're willing to compromise. And you have to stand on your integrity. And, and if you stand on that, people will stand with you and they will notice. I love that. I love that. 
Dr. Stevenson or Ms. Betty, do you have any way in on that? Well, I would just say that, you know, one of the things that she has shared was the fact that she had to show, she had a right to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, she had a right to be there and she had to let people know. And, and still within our own culture, interculturally, we still have those gender challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and you would think that they've gone by the wayside, but I think when we started out talking about uh, the impact of the church, a lot of those things have been rooted in tradition, uh, knowing your place, the Bible says, you know, all of that. And so when you have hundreds of years, it's, it's difficult to unlearn things. Mm. It's difficult to look at things in a different lens. I was listening to a, a, a presenter today and he started out his conversation with, you know, he held his hand up, look at this circle. You know, this is your circle of knowledge. You have to recognize this. And outside of this circle <laughs> is all of the things that you don't know, haven't mm. learned, the possibilities. So I think we've been so confined to our little circles of understanding, our little circles of how we define leadership, how we define what a woman's place and role is, mm -hmm. who should go and, and who should give them permission to step out there that we have to continue to push back against those things. And, and fortunate enough, we have enough women who are saying, nah, Mm -mm, that's not working for me. Mm -hmm. I'm coming straight at you. And it's those women that challenge those old stereotypes, those old traditions to continue to open that door of opportunity for others. You know, I have to talk to young men all the time and I'm like, you're only 30. Where did you get that from? Why are you thinking that particular way? But those things are passed down as well. But it's our responsibility because we do have a right to be here, to yes. speak up and to own our truth and to challenge those things that we don't feel are right, regardless of who's bringing that information to us, who's saying it, you know, there's a way to say it. I try to be very respectful in my deliberation. Most days, <laughs> some days, some days you just have to bring it, you know, but, but most of the time I try to be very careful or pull somebody off to the side, not blast them in the public, but mm -hmm. at the same time, being able to speak that truth to power and, and challenge those old systems that aren't productive and are primarily destructive. They're not helping anyone, they're hurting folk. And so that's a part of our responsibility as nurturers, as teachers, mm -hmm. as leaders, as all of those things that encompass us as black women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Dr. Stevenson, any way in of, of the modern Black female politician being unbought and unbossed? First of all, I, as I watched this documentary, I remain, you know, right, grew up as a, you know, wanting to be a writer, wanted to be a television news anchor, wanted to read the news. And so I, I love a good turn of phrase. So the fact that unbought and unbossed is, a, has, is alliteration. And she has some other phrases that she says, I'm just like, why could not be that clever? And so first upon hearing unbought and unbossed, un, unbought and unbossed, particularly coming into the role that I have at the college, um, I'm the only black female, I'm the only black professor at the institution. I'm the only black person on the cabinet. So I, I that standard, that bar had to be pretty high around not being bought, not being compromised, hmm. not being afraid or ashamed of myself as a black woman coming into this space. And, uh, and as, as uh, Representative Hollins mentioned, right, before I get in the space, they've already seen things on television. They've already heard things um, they've been, that have been primed through social institutions, including religious institutions, and stu including schools that says, here's what black women do. Here's how they act. Here's, here's their role. Here's their place as, as a uh, and I'm, and I don't want to shame any sort of profession, but what I'm, what I want to make the point about is it seems like th those access to professions were pretty limited. So the fact that you have women aspiring 
and winning in political offices that they're in these spaces that they had no business uh, being in unless they were cleaning them. Mm. Right, you're wrecking the worldviews of all in view. And uh, uh, on one hand, it, it's like, uh, you know, I know when I walk in the room, I'm already disrupting it. Mm -hmm. Just before I even open my mouth. So mm. when it comes out of my mouth, it had better be good. It had better be rich. It had better be accurate. And unfortunately, at times I'm at the point where I, I get so careful that I can't make a mistake. But then that, that takes the humanity out of my existence. And then I become this, this magical person, mm. right? Uh, that is just unrealistic for anybody to, to maintain. So how do we create that balance? I think we show up authentically. I think we show up uh, in our best selves, our best prepared self. And without question, Shirley Chisholm did that. She was able to spout data statistics she knew how to navigate that political space and that's what people could not take away from her so even when they asked her why are you here she was able to tell them and it was had very little little she said very little about her background her story she just said you know i have a right to be here because i'm a citizen and and i understand and i'm duly elected to represent the people of my district and here's how i'm going to do that so i love disrupting and dismantling stereotypes and biases and, yeah. and uh, coming authentically and like uh, Representative Hollins ha said, hair is such an expression for me. And that's something that nobody else can do. And so I, I just love doing that. And, and it's like, I think when you show up uh, uh, authentically and prepared that uh, those other things they might get, get irritated by, but they certainly can't say anything about my performance, my results. And that's what Shirley Chisholm did. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Miss Betty. One of the things I was thinking when she first went into Congress, mm -hmm. and they tried to put her on the Agricultural yes. Committee. Right. <laughs> like, oh no, that's not the one I came here for. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, I want to be over here because this is important to my people right now. And so again, coming in as her authentic self, coming in prepared coming in ready to, to just change that whole narrative, to change the world. And, and that's what she said at the end when she was talking about, you know, I don't wanna be uh, remembered as the first this and the only this. I want to be remembered that I dare to be a catalyst for change. And, and just the fact of her going in there and not accepting what they offered her, like, you should be glad we're giving you this committee. She said, no, that's, no, mm -mm, I want this. And she fought and got what she wanted because she was willing to, to stand firm and be committed to what she had in mind, what she believed would help her people the most. And that's what she did. Yes. Check them too. When they got <laughs> um, I remember the part where she talked about um, um, the man spitting in his handkerchief when she passed by. And when she found out what he was doing, she checked him and put him in his place. And it wasn't a, you know, a, she did it very graciously. She did it with class and grace and she checked him and she moved on. Yeah. And I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> my friends and my sororers, we're going to wrap up. And, and as we close, you know, as Miss Betty says, she wanted to be remembered as a catalyst for change in the 20th century. And we look at how now Vice President Harris carried that even during her um, candidacy and then her purposeful color choice in during the inauguration was a nod. Uh, to, to Shirley Chisholm. So what what two lessons, and because of time, maybe what one lesson uh, do we think, do you think that we need to keep and carry forward? I, I would say on the quote that she, you know, everyone knows her for, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, because we, we may not ever be the one they choose, but we have a right to be there, and we're going to assert our right anytime any place we feel the need to do so. Thank you, yes. Representative Hollins. I think the one lesson that I got out of this is when you walk into a space, 
you occupy every inch of that space you're in because you've earned the right to be there. It is your place to your place is there. And so that is one of the things that that the things that I got out of this out of this film. She was unapologetically uh, black and a woman and she brought all of that to the table and she was like this is who I am. It is your choice of whether you're going to accept me or not. If you don't find I'm moving on. <laughs> Thank you. Representative I, yeah. Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> I think what I what I will carry with me concerning is her her uh, uh, tenacity, um, her uncompromising tenacity to not only uh, pursue but to inquire, mm -hmm. and the fact that she would ask questions, she would challenge the status quo, she would challenge uh, 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 things said and done, and sought to to create change for those who really needed being the being mm -hmm. a candidate for the people knowing what the and knowing what the people needed by actually talking to them and just making assumptions about them. So being inquisitive um, with a, such a tenacity is what I would carry. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all for being on tonight and staying up after a long day. And I want to thank you for the work that you're doing in the community and on campus and around the state of Utah. Uh, you're needed, your voice is needed, and we love and appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, so the viewers, I want to thank you for tuning in and sticking with us. Uh, we hope you continue the discussion um, more in your homes and with your friends and family as we move forward because we do need our allies and our friends on our, on our side. So on behalf of the Utah Film Center and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, we wish you a good night and to go and do some good trouble. Have a good one.